everyone. Um, I'm going to start doing some videos since I'm an herbalist and into this whole poison path thing. Um, some of the videos I wanted to do were on some of the specific herbs and plants that I use in my various flying ointments and things that I make. So what I wanted to start with, because uh, I was actually having a conversation online with someone about this uh, maybe last week, um, is the difference between uh, Detoras and Brumansia. Because there's, and even within Detoras, um, there's multiple species of Detoras as there are Brumansia. And what I mention over and over again, when especially when I'm talking about aromatherapy or herbalism, is knowing the scientific name versus the common name for uh, the plants that we're working with because they often you know, the, the same plant or multiple plants can be called the same thing, but be very different. Like I, I always use the, the difference between European mandrake and American mandrake, two entirely different genus and species, as well as different, um, you know, magical and therapeutic properties. So that's just one of the things. So um, what I'm going to talk about, so I'm going to talk about a little bit um, with these, because I see a lot of times I see people talking about things and using things interchangeably that are actually different. <laughs> so like a lot of times Detoras and Brumansia are used interchangeably um, and they're all very different. So sometimes you'll have, like, the Detoras are more what people will refer to co common name-wise as the Devil's Trumpet. Detora stramonium in particular is called, uh, usually sometimes called the Devil's Weed. But Detoras in general, common name is Thorn Apple, which is based on what their um, seed pods look like. And Brumansia sometimes are also called Detora or Detora Brumansia. Um... And they're of the same botanical family, which is the Solanaceae family, which is the nightshade family, um, which, you know, gives us things like belladonna, henbane, magic root, tomatoes, eggplants, and that sort of thing. Those are the, the latter are on the less toxic side. Um, but Brumansia have their scientific name, their genus and species is different than what Detoras are. And visually, the way that you can tell the difference between a Datura and a Brumansia, which, and Brumansias are what are, are referred to as angel's trumpet. Um, I'll see that sometimes interchanged, like some people will refer to Datura as angel trumpet as well, because there's just a lot of common and folk names that get used interchangeably for these different plants. So um, the, the main visual difference with um, Detoras open up and outward, and they're, they're bell-shaped. Brumansia sort of open downward and outward, and they're bell-shaped. Now, Brumansia are typically um, native to South America, whereas uh, the Detoras, which some, in some places are classified as noxious weeds just because they grow everywhere in like the Southwest, Central America, parts of Europe, and uh, there's one particular species that's from India, and I think some in maybe North Africa as well. So, and within the, the genus and species, Detoras, you're going to have, you know, there might be slight differences in, okay, well, this particular species of Detora, the psychoactive part of it is just the leaves and the roots, or the flowers, leaves, roots, and, and, and you know, the whole plant or add the seeds as well. So to talk a little bit about some of the specifics of, you know, the differences between Brumansia and Datura is, you know, within each of these, uh, you know, the genus, which is Brumansia or Datura, you have several different types of species. And, you know, within that, you know, so, some of these are going to have multiple different names, folk names, common names, things like that. I mean, most, most, most plants do. Like, you have to realize when you say, like, oh, this is eucalyptus, or la that there are 450 different species of eucalyptus. So, you know, 
that having that botanical specificity is really important when you're working with these different herbs, especially when you're working with entheogenic herbs and psychoactive herbs, um, especially ones that can be toxic in certain doses. And a lot of what's talked about um, is what they call the LD50, which is the lethal dose at, at which percent the amount of that herb or plant material is lethal to 50% of the pop population or, per or persons or whatever. So you kind of have to know that kind of thing because some, some parts of the plant are going to be more toxic than others. Like when working with belladonna, the berry, people don't really use the berries and things because that's the most toxic part. Like five berries from a belladonna plant could kill a small child. Up to 10 could kill an adult. So, you know, you want to stay away from the berries. But, and more often than not, when you're using belladonna in any kind of, you know, preparation, flying ointments, flower, well, flower essences are different, but, you know, things like that. Uh, tinctures um, or smoking them, mo more often than not, you're using the leaves and the roots, not so much the flowers. Now, if you're making flower essences, you're using the live botanical material. So you're taking the flowers and putting them in, and, you know, that's a different process. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of, you know, knowing a little bit. And some of that within the different species changes. So one of the common things within, and the Brumansia and Datura are part of the Solanaceae uh, botanical family. Well, let's just call it the nightshade family because it's easier to pronounce. Um, and they are all high in tropane alkaloids, and that's what gives it its toxicity. So, and that's going to be things like atropine, scopolamine, hyoscyamine, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, and those things are sometimes what give them the, the sedative effects. Because, like, atropine is something that's used um, in surgical, like, anesthesia. Or if you've ever had your eyes dilated at the eye doctor, most likely they're putting atropine in your eyes. So, and that's why a lot of times what, you know, when you look at the side effects of using even flying ointments, using these different, um, you know, nightshades and things like that, like they'll say pup dilated pupils is one of the side effects. So, or vi blurred vision, in some extreme cases, if, if you're kind of on overdose level, you could actually, you know, temporarily lose your vision because, you know, your, dial your, your pupils might dilate so much that you can't see. Um, so that's, you know, what you have to look for. Now, one of the things to know when you're using these, like, and... I always, and I provide, you know, the safety information with all, with the products that I sell. Like, um, you don't want to be using these, like, if you're having a surgery within a week or two, because that could, because you already have those, uh, the tropane alkaloids like atropine and scopolamine and stuff in your system, is that when you're put under anesthesia, you could... Uh, I don't want to say overdose on anesthesia, but you could have a reaction to it, like uh, what they're called anti-cholinogenic uh, drugs. So um, now these plants all have long histories, um, especially like looking at Brumansia since it's native to South America. There's a lot of indigenous shamanic practices. Um, you know, sacred rituals and things that these plants were used for. Now, the angel's trumpet, Brumansia, um, it's interesting because the plant is so psychoactive that I've heard stories of people like, you know, sitting under a Brumansia tree or, you know, smelling the flowers and actually, you know, getting, you know, either passing out from it or getting high just from sitting under the tree. So, you know, you're not, you know, smoking it, eating it, you know, putting it on your skin or anything. You're just kind of in the presence of it, that it's that 
powerful. So, you know, for the different types of Bermondsia, um, you know, typically, you know, the leaves and the flowers and the seeds are going to be what are the most psychoactive uh, parts of the plant. So, so typically of a lot of these plants of the, of the nightshade family, it, and, it, and again, this is going to depend on how you're using it. So topically is probably the safest way to use it. Um, you know, I, and I use it in varying doses. Sometimes I'll put just a little bit on. Sometimes, you know, I kind of rub it up and down the arms, put a little bit, you know, in other places and, and apply multiple times. Um, the worst thing that's ever happened is the next day I've been a little drowsy and had like a dry fever. Um, which is different than like a fever you would have with like a flu or if you were sick. It's just this, you're just really hot and uncomfortable and you're not sweating it out. But it goes away. It's just more annoying than anything. Um, but yeah, these all kind of affect the parasympathetic nervous system. And, you know, some of the side effects, like I mentioned, with dilated pupils or some dry mucous membranes, you might have, like, dry mouth um, or things like that. Um, you know, it, again, this kind of comes back to knowing the dosage, especially if you are ingesting these. Now, the safest way to ingest any of these would be a flower essence. I personally don't find them to do much of anything, but... Um, the one area in which flower essences can be helpful is if you really want to get into, like, plant spirit communication and, like, understanding sort of, like, and journeying kind of with the plant. It's not going to make you hallucinate, get you high, or, you know, take you, you know, it, it, you know enhance, like, your astral travel or things like that. Uh, or magical practices. It's it's just more of a sort of getting in touch with nature, is the best way I can I can describe it. Um, I also just want to mention uh, I have my book in front of me. Um, this is a really uh, amazing book. I'm gonna pick it up because it's very heavy. But this is the Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Plants, Ethnopharmacology and Its Applications by Christian Rush. Um, it's a little pricey, I'm not going to lie, but it really has a lot of excellent information. And especially if you're new to like the poison path and you want a really good, accurate point of reference, um, this is a really good book for that. Because a lot of, I, I have a ton of books on, you know, poison plants and, uh, you know, things of that nature. And some go more into like the witchcraft lore and things like that. Some of them are more like, here's how you grow Datura and things like that. And um, what you're not, what you're not going to find in most books is recipes for how to make a flying ointment or how to make um, a specific type of tincture because there's probably, you know, legal issues. Because if I release a recipe and say, here's how you make a blah, 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 you know, a flying ointment or something. Um, and you make a flying ointment and you do it wrong and you have an adverse reaction. You know, I would be liable for that. So I can make recommendations of like, well, typically I'll use between X and X per, you know, eight ounces of a carrier oil or something like that. Um, but again, it's very rare that people have, you're more likely going to have an allergic reaction to, if you have like a, an allergy to the nightshades in general, than the toxicity of the plant. Or like if you're using wormwood and mugwort and have allergies to plants that are in the Asteraceae family. And what's really nice about this book is it does give you um, like the ritual use of it and how different cultures have used these. Because one of the things I find frustrating with a lot of um, witchcraft herbal books is they're very Eurocentric and focused on that aspect. So, you know, Angel's Trumpet is not native to Europe, so there's not going to be a lot of lore on that from, you know, the European perspective. And, you know, when you're looking at, 
especially things that ha uh, ha pertain to indigenous cultures and how and come from shamanic lineages that there's a lot that these are sacred plants and that's something that gets brought up a lot of times you know it, when there's talk about cultural appropriation and things of that nature is kind of understanding that these plants were used in very sacred ways and the people who use them have decades if not hundreds of years of knowledge on how to use them properly so you know if you're looking to get some angels trumpet to get high as fuck and you know trip balls you know you're you're kind of do you know you're not respecting the shamanic lineage from which this plant comes because when they're used for ritual purposes and this is what i try to impart with um my the products that I make is that these are for opening spiritual pathways for getting in touch with your spirituality whether you're doing like astral travel work or ancestral work or things like that so it, it's not yeah you know, when people are like oh will this make me high I'm like no it won't you might feel some physiological effects from them but, you know, if you want to trip balls, go get some mushrooms or LSD or ecstasy or whatever and, you know, have at it. Um, so there's multiple types of romanzia. And by types, I mean species of it. And sometimes it's based on the color. Sometimes it's based on who discovered it. So if you, if you see something, um, I'll get into this a little bit more with one of the deturas or things like um, if you ever see something um, and the, the species ends with two eyes, like I-I, and it's like, this is eucalyptus smith-I, or smithy, I don't know how you pronounce it, that, uh, that really just indicates who it was discovered by. Um, or I think there's Datura Righty, uh, W-R-I-G-H-T-I-I. So that just indicates who it was discovered by, or the scientist that decided you know, to give it its name. Um, and if you ever see something that says Brubanzia SPP, that's just talking about the species as a whole. So, um, you know, that's, that's something, you know, just a little bit of technical knowledge as an herbalist and aromatherapist for when you're looking at these different types of things. Because sometimes people use things interchangeably. Like I have a Datura Brumanzia fly ointment I bought from somewhere. Um, and it's, you know, I had to kind of research through this book to figure out, like, okay, that's the common name. What is this? And it's, uh, really, it's a, from a specific type, uh, species of angel's trumpet. It's, it's like the sanguine, it's like a red angel's trumpet or something like that, which it's one of its synonyms is Datura Brumanzia, even though it's Brumanzia sang versicolor or sanguina or something like that so um you know that's just again something to kind of consider and i like brunanzia um you know sometimes these things get really bad reputations people have had really bad trips from them because they don't know what they're doing and you know that can happen. I mean, you know, especially if you're ingesting things or I've seen people have the most problems is when they directly ingest something without, you know, making it into a tincture or a flower essence or something of that nature. Or uh, you can smoke certain parts of the plants like smoking Datura leaves is going to be different than, than crushing up and smoking Datura seeds. So the seeds, you know, that could be a little bit more are going to be more toxic. And you might have a bad trip, you know, smoking or consuming just the seeds. Whereas if it was prepared in a proper way and knowing, you know, by someone who knows, you know, the LD50, the lethal dose and things like that and how to prepare it in a way that is safe for human consumption. So, so now we're going to talk about Datura. And there's a lot of different types of Daturas. And again, they have a lot of different common names. Sometimes they overlap with Brumanzia, but they're different because, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, Datura's open up and outward. Um, Brumanzia uh, kind of is bell shaped and opens downward. So 
and the, the Daturas are usually what are associated with the devil, whereas the Bramanzi is associated with angels. Always good to know. So, and, and with Daturas, typically the seeds, the, the in some cases the flowers, but not all. Um, the leaves typically and the roots are going to be what have the most psychoactive uh, properties to them. And the most common types of Datura, like I primarily work with Datura Inoxia, and that's sometimes, and that's one that's very common in the Southwest. Um, and it's similar to Datura Stramonium, but it's just a different species. And they're often called thorn apple. Both, both of them are called thorn apple. Um, and they have dozens of different folk names for them. Everything from, you know, Datura noxia is, also, is referred to as devil's weed. Datura stramonium is also referred to as devil's weed. So, you know, it, it's, if you're calling something devil's weed, it's not necessarily, you're, you're not specifying what this, the actual species is that you're using. And, you know, as an herbalist and aromatherapist, I'm all about that botanical specificity. So with the Tura Anoxia, you know, the leaves, roots, flowers, and seeds are where you're going to have the most psychoactive properties from it. And because, and again, even though this is something that's indigenous to the Americas, it does have its shamanic lineage. Um, you know, it goes back, there's a lot of ritual use from the Aztecs and things, and you know, in Mesoamerica uh, and in that culture and things like that. And these were used medicinally as well as for spiritual purposes. Um, because that's really what entheo entheogenic drugs are, are plants are for is to for opening those spiritual to have a spiritual experience and you know there's different preparations that can be made with deturas um i have flower essences i have tinctures i have flying ointments i have smoking blends with that with detura leaves in them um i haven't tried smoking the seeds yet but you know it's only so many days in the week so now something to consider is the cultural significance of this with the indigenous cultures. So with the Navajo, um, deterrents were associated with inducing visions like trance states for, for again, that spiritual, for spiritual purposes. Um, it's also associated with love magic used as an aphrodisiac and pleasure. You know, because some of those, because things, plants that have aphrodisiac properties often boost your libido. So it kind of all works together. And obviously if it's an aphrodisiac, you know, it's something you probably would use in love magic. Um, you know, it's been used um, for divination, uh, for protection, and also in hunting magic. Um, as well as for more traditional purposes as a medicine, because a lot of these plants, you know, have natural healing properties to them, even though they're toxic. So like deturas can be, have been used, um, by indigenous cultures to, you know, heal wounds and burns and things like that. So you might not necessarily think of that with, something with with when you're looking at that kind of plant uh, entheogenic plant that it also can be used to heal the the body as well so when people experiment with detouras and you're looking at what they call shamanic dosages and these are the ones that induce really profound visions hallucinations and can even be you know delirium you know cause delirium and things like that but this is also where you can easily overdose on it. So I don't have the shamanic lineage and knowledge to know how to prepare something in that dose. That's not going to kill me or make me overdose and, you know, end up in the hospital or something. Because I've heard horror stories of people, you know, 
overdosing on these things and, you know, just blacking out for three days, having sold all their furniture and, you know, you know, bought a yacht or something, you know. <laughs> so you can do some crazy shit on these things if you don't know what you're doing. So that is why um, I don't recommend just going out and starting to experiment with these things willy-nilly if you have no formal training in herbalism and, or aromatherapy or any kind of botany, any kind basic understanding because of this because a lot of what I learned as an aromatherapist isn't just like oh this smells good and you can use it for that is also learning you know human anatomy and physiology and how these things affect different parts of our body in different ways so but you know the experiences that you're going to have like I work with Detour a lot and um I found, uh, the first time I did a, a Datura Anoxia-based flying ointment, I found it a little too harsh for me. So when I started making my own, I added stuff to it to kind of mellow it out a little bit. So I think I added, like, some Blue Lotus to mine. And I, it's really quite lovely. And what you're going to find, and, and I always... It, 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 it's a mellow high. It's not... And, and, and I'm using high very liberally. Like, it's not the kind of high you get if you smoke a bowl. But, you know, you feel more mellow, relaxed, but then you just kind of, it's very deep and introspective and very, and very opening of those, again, spiritual pathways. So whether you're using it to really have deep meditative experiences, whether you're using it for spirit communication or astral travel, it's opening up the, it's helping you to open up those pathways in a different way. So, and can influence your dreams. Like I know for me, like Datura, uh, I, I would say as far as things that make your dreams completely crazy, um, mugwort and wormwood are probably the, the top ones for crazy dreams. And then followed by Datura. Um, I've done, yeah, I also have a Datura stramonium, uh, flying ointment, and I think I have a flower essence for that. I also have a Brumansia tincture, and tinctures and flower essences are a little bit different. Uh, tinctures tend to be, uh, you can do tinctures and elixirs in one of two ways. You take the plant, the dry plant material, and you, um, for a tincture, it's soaked in grain alcohol, strained, and then you add, add, some, add some distilled water to it to uh, dilute it. With an elixir, you're adding the dried uh, plant material to a brandy and honey base. So it's going to be a little bit sweeter. It just depends on the taste and things like that. But, you know, it's a difference between with, with that elixir, I might take three drops, whereas with the tincture, I could take like two, dro two dropper fulls multiple times a day. And I have a couple of different tinctures like that, and they're all different. They don't taste very good. Um, I have a fly agaric tincture. I actually hate the taste of mushrooms, so that one is just like... <sighs> but it's very lovely, though. So there's different, uh, as I mentioned, you know, with some of, some of the different species of Daturas, there's one called Datura metal, M-E-T-E-L, and that's what that one one is native to India, and you don't see that used too much in in a lot of these entheogenic pre, uh, preparations. It might be in other places, but typically you're going to see Datura noxia or Datura stramonium. Um, but again, you know these all have different medicinal and ritual uses. And I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the Datura stramonium. So again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, some the Daturas, um, you can smoke them. Um, I would say doing a little bit of the leaf would probably be a good place to start before the seeds because the seeds can be more intense. Um, but again, you want to have something prepared by someone who knows what you're doing because you don't just take some dried herb and throw it into a thing and smoke it. It's the same thing with making, um, like, loose incense blends. Like, with a loose incense blend, you need to add a binding, you know, you grind up your herbs to whatever consistency you like, whether it's, you know, completely powder and pulverized or a little bit grainy, whatever. 
and then you add a binding agent to it like um tragacanth or like xanthan gum or something like that and then you add a little bit of distilled water maybe some essential oils you blend it all together and then you kind of lay it out to dry so the smoking blends are put together in the same way so you're using a little bit of honey and distilled water to add a little bit of moisture to them so you're not smoking because if you ever smoke dry ass weed that sucks and burns so again you know these are have been used ritually and you know mesoamerican indigenous cultures and that's just something we have to recognize and be mindful of when we're using these things that they they are very sacred and it's not to say that we can't use them for our own sacred purposes so one of the things i've come to understand is that a lot of especially people who um from uh, you know whose lineages are from europe and and things like that so we have very broken lineages with our own cultures and customs and things like that and like you know i did my you know genetic testing many years ago or whatever so it's like yeah i'm brought you know mostly ukrainian but you know got the whole Carpathian mountain swath, you know, of all the Eastern European countries, a little bit of Germany, a little bit of Irish, English, and some other places and things, or North Africa and West Asian. But, you know, I identify more as Ukrainian because that's kind of the culture I was raised in. But what's interesting as I've gone back through and learning about Eastern European folk magic and witchcraft and looking at how much of that was sort of absorbed into Ukrainian everyday common culture, but the meaning of it was lost. Like, I, I have a book on Slavic witchcraft. I'm like flipping through this book. I'm like, wow, my grandmother makes so much more sense now. Was my grandmother a witch? No. <laughs> Did she practice folk magic? Not that she knew of, but she was. But, you know, all these different things, you know, down to the woven patterns in linens and the Paisenki, uh Ukrainian eggs, which are these really ornately painted eggs. Those were amulets for fertility and prosperity. And there was a particular type of painted doorbell uh, with like a fabric strip that was, it, it almost looked kind of like, like a cowbell almost but that you would put on the door. Well, it wasn't just to notify you that someone was opening the door. It was something that was used to welcome spirits, good spirits into the home. So, you know, those things kind of got lost, you know, in translation. I never knew that that's what that's there for. Maybe my grandmother didn't even know that that's what that was on the door for. But I know that sound so perfectly. And now, like, I understand, like, oh, there is... The, that broken lineage that the, the story got lost somewhere along the way and so I mean that's something we just have to kind of understand uh, about ourselves and you know about these sacred plants that we're using and you know just respect them and really you know look at how you're using them I don't use these plants to get high or you know to have fun i use them to connect with the spirit world i use them to connect with myself to do like shadow work and to really like understand the universe and things like that which is what they were meant for and that is i think the most important important thing when you're looking at using any of these entheogenic herbs especially ones like romanzia and things that have that deep shamanic lineage and legacy to them and, and very sacred ritual usage is to really understand that and respect it and you know kind of I guess in a way just connect with the plant on a deeper level and there's different ways that you can you know connect with nature or connect with plants like you know okay i detour i don't know if may grow in pennsylvania or i mean i could grow some well i'm not so great at growing things because i live in the city and it's hard to grow things here but you know 
if you're somewhat like connect with nature, like sit there and really like pay attention to the plant and like look at, how, think about how it makes you feel. Like, does it make you anxious? Does it make you calm? What, what kind of things is this bringing up for you? Like imagery or what story is that plant telling you about itself? And, you know, I'll, I'll probably end, although I always say I'm like, and to sign off with, and then I go on for 20 more minutes. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting, and you can look up some videos on YouTube about this, is, and I forget the name of it, but there is a device and an app that sort of translates the sounds that plants make. And I know there was a, a particular video um, with sunflowers and like they hook up these sensors to it and it translates into this app what the sound is. And it was really hauntingly beautiful. But it made me think of plants in such a different way. And yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a weird technology thing and kind of expensive. I mean, I think the, the setup for it's like over 200 bucks or something. Um... But, you know, it really made me think about plant communication and that these are and were, you know, something that was alive. Maybe, and, and has consciousness in, in a way. Um, I think all living things have... have can be influenced. Like, I was really into, um, I think it's called The Secret Power of Water or The True Power of Water. I think there's a couple books by Dr. Masuro Amoto. And he had done these um, experiments with water crystals. Like, you know, he would take, you know, the bottle of water and, you know, scream and yell and curse at it. And then he would take one and, you know, it would be surrounded with love and gratitude and what. And then they would take these, like, microscopic photos of it. And the water crystals that were exposed to anger and violence were, like, fragmented and, and, and looked broken and jagged and shard. But the ones that were exposed to love and gratitude and things like that were beautifully ornate and just gorgeous. So think about that and also consider the fact that the human body is like 80 percent water i think 80 90 percent water something like that so how we're affected by things is more macro than micro maybe um it's bigger it's much bigger part of things and, you know, for someone like I'm, an, I'm an empath, so I can feel things much and see things much differently than other people do at times. So, you know, I sometimes, I, you know, I'll feel bad when a tree gets cut down or like falls down or something like that. Like one of my memories I had, I think I was a teenager at the time, must have been... I think we drove to Disney World with my family for vacation one year from Pennsylvania to Florida because we're insane. Um, and this would have been, it was a couple years, maybe 1991. So it was a couple years after Hurricane Hugo. And I remember as we were driving through South Carolina, we were driving through a national forest and all it was were all these trees that were just broken from the hurt that were destroyed during and died during the hurricane and it was just this weird like it, it just driving past that just stuck with me for almost 30 years now you know just seeing that forest destroyed and I'm sure it's grown back and is beautiful and and whatnot now but that level of destruction and and the way it, it was interesting because all the trees you know it was like they were upright and then the tops of them were folded, you know, had fallen over. And they were all completely dry. There was no foliage or anything on them because, I mean, this was two years later. But, you know, it was just sort of a profound kind of experience looking at it that way. So everything kind of can have feelings to it. So 
plants too. So love your ha house plants. Talk to them. Tell your cats not to eat them. Moon likes to eat my spider plant. I'm <laughs> like the jankiest looking spider plant. It's the only one. She's always just like chomp, chomp, chomp. But anyways, before I battle on for another hour, um, thank you for watching. I'm going to try to do some more videos that are plant related about this, all this stuff, because I'm getting more and more, you know, requests and more information about a lot of, you know, how these plants are used and connecting with them in different ways. So, um, and I got plenty of plants to talk about so and hopefully at some point in time I will actually have time to update my website with a lot of this information because I've, I've got like Google documents everywhere and all this research that I've done over like the past year or two and now I just need to like put it together so um yeah but anyways thank you for watching and don't forget to click like and subscribe and much love to you all especially my Patreon, my Patreon subscribers <laughs>